All right. Well, I know that we have a lot of slides to get through. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we'll, we will get this show on the road for everyone. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, unfortunately, my camera, for whatever reason, is not working. So I am just a voice. You don't get to see me, <laughs> but I am just a voice here. Um, so uh, we are doing a wonderful webinar this evening called Amanita of the Northeast, and our presenter is Bill Bakaitis. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming, for being here this evening. This is being recorded, so in case you have to duck out or um, if you've missed this, um, that you are watching recording here. Um, so this will be recorded if you miss anything. So as I said, um, today's topic is Amanita of the Northeast, and I'm Lauren Bohr. I'm the Education Coordinator for Public and Youth Programs at Mohawk Preserve. So throughout this whole presentation, I'll be monitoring things. Um, if you have questions, you can put it in our chat, um, our chat box, and I'm happy to to. Uh, squeeze in some questions there and we'll, hopefully we'll have some good time for questions at the tent at the end um, and if you have any issues tech issues you can always email me I have my email open so I can monitor those um, so let's see I mentioned that we're going to be recording this and that you can use the chat box for questions um, I do want to say as a reminder um, that at Mohonk Preserve we have um, adopted leave no trace principles, and that includes the prohibition of uh, removing anything living or non-living. So there is no foraging on our property or other collection activities. There are times that we do walks like with Bill and um, we will use some of the mushrooms for teaching purposes um, and we manage that sustainably. But um, on Mohawk Preserve lands, there is no foraging. Um, for mushrooms or, or other kinds of foraging as well. Um, the topic tonight is Amanita. So these are not ones that a lot of people um, forage anyways. We will discover some unique characteristics about them. Um, so with that, that I'm going to introduce Bill. Um, so Bill Bikaitis that taught at Dutchess County Community College. Yeah, Dutchess Community College, there we go, for 38 years before retirement in 2006. And during his teaching career, he was granted sabbaticals to study graduate level mycology at both SUNY New Paltz and at the New York State Museum in Albany, where he worked with John Haynes, the New York State mycologist. Um, he's a popular speaker, especially here at Mohonk Preserve. He has many different lectures that are all recorded and are in our archives on our YouTube channel. And you can check those out afterwards if you haven't already. Um, he's given educational programs in mycology at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook and the Culinary Institute of America over in Hyde Park, uh, Hudsonia at Bard College, as well as many other institutions all over the Northeast. So uh, in 1983, he founded the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association. And since 1984, has worked with poison control networks throughout the Northeast, which I think will probably come up a little bit in um, tonight's talk. Um, and his articles have been published in the New York State Conservationist, Adirondack Life, the Mid-Hudson Magazine, the Poughkeepsie Journal, and Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming, where he's, uh, are you still a current, are you still an editor of that magazine? No, no, no longer. No longer, no longer but at one time you were. All right. Yeah. So with all of that, um, I want to welcome you and I'm going to turn the reins over to Bill and uh, he's going to share all about Amanita of the Northeast with us. OK, well, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> uh, a word to those who are who are uh, in our audience here, how we got here. Uh, it was in uh, 2019 that I, I was uh, in talks with uh, people at the this Dan Smiley Research Center, part of Mohong Preserve. Uh, Dan Smiley uh, and his cohorts collected uh, uh, flora of the of the, the, the property. Uh, one of the things that was done was to, to keep track of what kind of uh, plants uh, and mushrooms also were uh, fruiting at the time or blooming at the time or leafing out or whatever, or whatever and temperatures, and, and they became a good proxy record for a lot of the research now which shows global warming. So um, I, I, I was brought in uh, to this. I brought my uh, library over and my, my laboratory over, and we were going to set up some programs for uh, citizen scientists uh, in the Smiley Center. Then COVID struck and uh, shutdowns occurred throughout the Northeast, throughout the whole United States. And a lot of staff, uh, there was a lot of staff churn and turnover. 
And uh, during that time, we decided to just start one of these programs uh, um, through the educational offices, uh, which Lauren is now the, uh, the, the speaker. So, um, so we did that, and uh, it seemed to work well, so we just continued over the years, and this is the 10th program. I mention this because I'm not going to, I'm going to stick pretty narrowly to the topic at hand here the taxonomy of Amanita in the Northeast of the United States. So if you if you if you've missed some of the other programs, I'll just tell you what they are what they're about. We have uh, two programs on um, basics of functions of fungi. Uh, one is that uh, deals with the um, the biology and life cycles, and then another one deals with the the um, ecological significance of mushrooms and their functions. So the, those two basic programs, and, you know, rather than talking, rather than having the talk heard by 20 people, there are thousands and thousands of people who have listened in on those talks. So they've been, they're quite uh, well received, I'll put it that way. Uh, we also have uh, a few talks on edibles and, and toxic mushrooms of the area. And uh, we have three programs on uh, seasonal uh, fungi. We have uh, one in spring and one fall and one winter sequence. And then we have uh, two specific uh, programs who dealt with uh, with different genera, one on mor mor morels and one on chanterelles. So the one here on Amanita is the third program on, on specific taxonomy. So with that, I just want to uh, to say that I'm going to, I'm going to want to stick pretty closely to the taxonomy. We have a lot to cover here. It's a, it's a large uh, catalog of, of, of Amanita mushrooms, which can be found on this property uh, or throughout the Northeast. And I, I, I take some, a moment to point that out because uh, many uh, field guides will only have, you know, a dozen or 20 Amanita. There are many more, and I, I'm going to give you a tool which you can use, and you already have that if you've downloaded the, uh, one of the links that, that, uh, that Lauren sent you. Uh, so with that tool, you'll be able to uh, to progress and, and make some quite good quality preliminary dis the determinations of what the, the mushrooms are around here. Uh, so uh, the images, almost all of the images here are my own for my own cameras. They're cameras over the, the, the course of the year, so the quality differs a lot and the format differs, so it's been hard to pull them all together in one, one program. It's the, You'll, you'll notice some of them look kind of uh, weirdly disfigured, but that's it. This is Rod Tullis. Uh, Rod uh, was a, an amateur mycologist, uh, a uh, curious naturalist, who has now become the world's leading authority on Amanita. And uh, you'll see his website there, and I reference it, uh, that in the printing, uh, the printed material. Uh, I have worked with Rod for years, and he and I have spoken about most of the mushrooms presented here. Um, and more about that as we go along. Now, when you're going to identify a mushroom, <clears throat> you, you, there's, there's a process one goes through. Obviously, you walk through the woods and you see a mushroom. That would be the, the, the observation. You would just We see all sorts of things. And of the three to 5,000 mushrooms that might fruit around here, well, we see something. And we make a hypothesis about what it might be. And that doesn't necessarily mean we've identified the mushroom. We might have recognized it, or we might just making a, an educated guess or a foolish guess. Uh, what then remains is to confirm or reject that hypothesis. And those of you who have done anything in science will realize that this is part of the heart of the scientific process here, scientific method. Uh, Below that are two uh, methods by, by which one could identify mushrooms. I'm going to be talking here tonight about the field identification, and I, I'm going to present you with some conceptual keys based on the stem base of the, the stem of the mushroom and the bulb types that are there, and we'll make some, some tentative hypotheses. From that, one then goes either to the printed monographs, and there's, a, there's, there's some literature cited there, or more, more, more likely, Ron's going to go to the internet, and you could look at Rod uh, Tullis's site, or uh, David Cove's site, uh, Michael Cove's site, mushroomexpert.com. I would recommend you starting with Mushroom Expert. It's a very good site to start with. So that's what we're going to do here. There is another way that mushrooms are identified, and this is is a very. It's now become the dominant method. You take a little DNA from a fruiting body or anything, 
you go through a, a, a rigorous process where you amplify the little bit of material you have, then you then you go into to to cleave the different genome sequences from that. You use electrophoresis to have the 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 these these the, the genetic material spread out in a gel, and then you look at the the barcodes that are there, and uh, you can then we call that DNA fingerprinting. You all these mushrooms have a distinctive barcode, and from that you can make a tree of life, and this has become the dominant method by which things are identified. It doesn't mean though that field identification is not valid. Uh, we'll see through this process that, that we, as we go through here that you and I can make some distinctions which are very close to those made by DNA. So I, I don't, I, and, and I say this because we don't bring all that laboratory with us out in the field. We just bring our eyes and hands and sometimes we taste things, we smell things. These are field identifications. So the concept of Amanita, of all the mushrooms that, that grow around here, some of them have gills. So Amanita is a gilled mushroom. And amanitas have a vulva uh, uh, at the at the base of the uh, of the stem. A vulva is a is an encapsulation of a growing mushroom down there. And when the mushroom does grow, out from the gills come spores, and the spores are white. So white spores that come from a vulva mushroom that has gills, that's amanita. Okay, that's that's the basic hallmark of amanita. And here's our first amanita. This is amanita abrupta. Uh, and in this case, you'll see that it has this bulb at the bottom, and it was encased by a universal veil, and that that then, when the mushroom grew, and it just, when there's enough mo moisture in the, in the soil, it just zooms upward very easily and quickly. And that, that membrane that encapsulated the whole mushroom called the universal veil ruptures. And depending upon the consistency of that, whether they're balloon kind of shell, uh, cells or they're filamentous cells, they either break up, form warts on the top, or they stay behind and form a, a cup at the bottom. So that's, that's, that's the universal veil. We see here white gills. There are a few uh, amanita that have uh, colored gills. Uh, and they're very distinctive. We'll have a look at those. But most of them are white, and the gills are free. That means they don't touch the stem. And this is a partial veil. The partial veil is called the annulus or the ring. And until the mushroom is the gills are mature, it really sticks to the to the gills. It protects them. Okay, so this is this is a look at a, at a at an amanita mushroom. Almost all of them are mycorrhizal. And those of you who have listened to the second uh, program or taken part of that understand that mycorrhiza means that the mushroom and the host tree or shrub in which it's attached form a common union, a common marriage, so to speak. And um, and that's that's they each sustain one another. So maybe 850 species worldwide, over 100 in the Northeast, half of them are undescribed. This is the Amanita button. This is underground, and this is what the mushroom looks like before the veil ruptures. This is the vulva here, and before the veil, the universal veil ruptures, you cut it apart from top to bottom, and you can see a little mushroom in there. Okay? And this mushroom will have distinctive microscopic characteristics. The, as I already mentioned, the, the ring will stay attached to the gills until they mature. The gills themselves have a particular kind of construction. And it's a, a divergent uh, gill trauma. And we'll have a look at that just momentarily. And the stem itself has very characteristic baseball kind of shaped kind of cells. So this then is what the amanita looks like in the ground. And when there's enough moisture, it just, just expands. Uh, were we in a workshop now, we would look at some of these characteristics. We would look at, at the gill trauma under a microscop, un, mi microscopic uh, magnification and be able to see how this is divergent. They're kind of hard to see here, but you can play with that, make it more, more visible by playing with the magnification and how much uh, the focus and how much light is there. But that's, those are things that we, one would do in, um, in a workshop. And here again, you see the clavate stem cells, the baseball uh, shape st stem cells. Those are all distinctive to Amanita. Again, 
Here's an amanita. This is amanita by Sporigera, a deadly poison mushroom. And again, you see free white gills. You see the annulus here. You see this long stem, which is forced upward by these big, big elongated uh, cells. And down below, you see the, the, the vulva, the cup, <coughs> the remnants of the universal veil in this case here. Now, amanita are not the only mushrooms that spring from an egg. Uh, stink, stink balls uh, do as well. This is the, uh, uh, the mutant, mutinous caninus, the dog stinkhorn. And uh, this is the, the egg from which it springs. And this is the mushroom here as it grows up. Uh, the gleba material here contains spores and they smell like rotten meat, the function of which is to draw flies to this and then the flies carry, carry away with the spores. This is Phallus ravenellii, uh, uh, a, a, a larger Phallus mushroom, larger stinkhorn. Uh, I'm finding, I found these in my garden yesterday. So not this one, but I found them in the garden. You can tell them, you can tell them from yards away by the smell. It's a very sharp, uh, stinky smell. Very often, uh, Amanita uses a, a, a chemical, uh, uses for a number of mushroom, uh, mushroom species, but the, the chemical is called Meltzer's reagent. Essentially, it's chlorohydrate and iodine. Yeah, it's almost impossible to get this now because of chlorohydrate, which is a controlled substance. So you need a license to be able to get it. But you can get almost the same results by using just iodine itself. You take a mushroom and you put it on a, a plate of glass and make a spore print. And then if you put a drop of, um, of melters on that or iodine, you'll see that some of the spores, the spores may turn blue-black. And that's called an amyloid reaction. And here you see the amyloid reaction on the cells themselves. They get that blue-black staining on the, on the surface of the cells. It has to do with starch. Ones that don't react are called inamyloid. And you see there's another amanita here, which don't have that. Now, using that technique, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and divide the whole genus of Amanita into various subsections. There's some, there's some of them which are in amyloid. This would be the Amanita subsection. The Lepidellas are all amyloid. One could do that. You don't need the chemical to do that, however, because there are some correlates to that. If the mar margin of the mushroom is striate, and we'll have a look at that, then the cells will almost always be non-amyloid. If they are non-striate, if the, the edge of the margin is smooth, they will almost always be amyloid spores. So you can, you can then uh, use these characteristics based on these field characteristics to divide uh, the, the genus into subgenera in the same way. And there are other ways you can sort by field characteristics alone. I point these out not to go into detail with them here, but just to point out that we'll be using one of those methods. We're going to be using uh, a method which, which will divide the amanita by the shape of the base of the stem. And here are nine different stem, bulb stem or bulb types uh, at the bottom of the bulb. And using those, we can then start to divide the, the section of amanita up, uh, the genus, into, into various groups that will then we can make some minor character, uh, additions to what they look like and make some very reasonable field identifications. So this, the current presentation, what I'm going to do here is to illustrate Northeastern Amanita by these nine bulb types. I think this is a very easy tool for the use and field idea of mushrooms. I've given it to you. You have it. We're going to rehearse it tonight. And you'll be able to go out and make some reasonable distinctions uh, right off the bat by using this method. I also want to document the northward movement of southern species of Amanita. Uh, this was one of the reasons why I, I came over to Mohonk Preserve to begin with, uh, but I've, I've kept detailed notes on a number of these and we'll be able to look at that. And, I, and I've also pointed out already, I want to uh, argue that amateur mycology can make significant contributions to our knowledge of fungi. Okay, so there's the three bulb types, okay? There's a club, marshmallow, and a sac type. So this is just a ring, ring binder of small uh, uh, four by five, five by eight cards, maybe or three by four cards, but a four by six cards, it says. So there it is. Use a pencil. You know you're gonna put a, uh, the shape of the bulb on one of the, 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 
the, the pages there. Uh, this is card card paper rather than just loose paper, so it's thick. So make the, sh the, the shape there. So you're going to dedicate a page for each bulb type. And then you're going to notate on that uh, the, the different species that have that shape. So when we have a club-shaped bulb, where this is essentially the blusher group of mushrooms. You've got rubescence. It stains red. Flavorubescence, yellowish within the base stains red. Flavoconia, yellow patches. Parsi volveda has no annulus, no ring around it. Spissa is stout and shiny as gray-brown. You may have different kinds of notes for yours. Farinosa, powdery, gray-brown, uh, no annulus. Wells the eye, uh, uh, salmon yellow and uh, patches and an annulus. Crenulata, brownish beige, uh, some people call it champagne. Uh, uh, and that one is deadly mushroom. And uh, Franchetti, which I don't, has not been reported in North America and in, sorry, in New York yet. And I've, I've added another one here, Spissa with epidiculate margin. So you can add this and maybe use a second page if you need to. Over here, I've listed whether it has a radial margin, the size. So with that in mind, as I go out in the field, if I find a mushroom, an amanita that has that bulb type, I just I then go to this card and very quickly I can rule out and, and rule in certain fungi. So this is the first one. It's amanita rubescence, the blusher. It's a very common mushroom. You see it has that club-shaped bulb and it, it sort of stains red. Throughout this talk, you'll see this knife several times. It's six inches long from stem to stern. The handle is three inches the, and the blade is three inches. So this is a very common mushroom. There's another view of it. What happens in these club-shaped mushrooms is that the vulval material here is so fragile, it breaks up and forms warts on the cap of the mushroom. So here it's, it looks kind of brownish, but it stains red, you know, it's reddish, brownish non-striate margin, you see there, and that's that's the blusher. Now, there are probably a lot of different mushrooms that look a lot like that, that, that new DNA has now divided up into their own species. But for, as far as field characteristics go, you're, you're pretty safe to say it's in the rubescence group, right? And there's going to be tremendous diversity in, in nature as you, you go out and look there. You, here's one which is flocky, which is a little shaggy, small shaggy filaments on the stem. That comes from the way that, that the, the, either the gills detach from the stem or the, the stem rises up and takes part of the vulval material with it. And this is the, the gills below there, and this is the, the top. Now, DNA evidence uh, indicates there are probably six or eight other names used for this taxa, uh, and actually for most of them around here. From there are also uh, confusing environmental factors. This is the blusher, but here it's being being occupied uh, by another um, fungus. It's a hypomycete, a mycetes of fungus. A hypo is growing on. So it's one fungus growing on another one, and it makes these very distinct phallic-shaped mushrooms. So this is uh, an Amanita rubescence, as you see it here, with hypomyces hyalinus here covering the mushroom. There are some uh, rubescents which are white all by themselves, and that's called a variety. If you have a, a, a one distinction in a mushroom, it's, they're, they're identical except for one distinction. This one is white, the other one was brown. And one, one distinction is called a variety, uh, so, so, sorry, called a form. So the variety here tells me that, that there's at least not only the color, but there's another microscopic characteristic by which you can tell this mushroom. And you would have to go to the literature to find that. But if you find this mushroom, you know it's in the rubescence group, the staining red here, and the club-shaped bulb. And, uh, and then you go to try to sort out which one it is. Now, this one is yellow, and it stains red at the bottom. Well, that's flavorubescence or flavorubens. Okay. Uh, both uh, flavorubescence and uh, Rubescence, when you cut the bulb open, there'll be red stains at the bottom there. And, and it's present right from the beginning. So again, here's a flocos flavor rubescence. Uh, and some people may have already taken this and looked into DNA and they found other things and given it a different name. You'll find that there are many different names for these mushrooms. They go back and forth quite a bit. 
This is one which is quite easy to identify as well. Here again, you see the bulb at the bottom, okay? And this is this very yellow mushroom with a yellow ring around it, very faint striations uh, you pick up from the note you put. And uh, the Volvo is uh, the fragments break off in the soil and there'll be little yellow flecks in the soil. So it's often called yellow patches. Here's, a, here's two of the same ones. You see the club at the bottom. You see where the, the, the patches remain on the, the, the top. And under this condition, one could easily misidentify it as Amanita muscaria. Lots and lots and lots of mushrooms are called Amanita muscaria, and they're not. Okay? So this is one which often is, but this one is, to my eye, one of the most handsome mushrooms one can see. And it's, it's present on, on, uh, all throughout the area in the summertime. This is one which is present, but people don't report it very often. I think they might think it's uh, it's uh, Russia or something else. But here you see the striations. You see a little tiny bulb, the bulb at the bottom there, a little club-shaped bulb at the bottom. You see the striations. It's not commonly collected at all. And they, they, as this breaks off, it make, leaves a powder on the top of it. So this is Amanita farinosa. The powder is a lot like uh, flour, farinosa. Here's another that has a, a delicate warts on the top, almost like a, like a, a flowery substance. This is a Wellesley eye, the salmon color. I've never found that. Well, I may have, but I've never got good confirmation on it. This, this one is, I found, and it's very common throughout the area. This is Amanita crenulata, and it's a, it's a Charles Peck species. He identified this well over 100 years ago. This is deadly. Till uh, maybe two decades ago, we didn't know what this was. We knew it killed people. We didn't know what it was. Rod Tallis called it New Jersey number 27. But then we found uh, uh, the literature and was able to, get, to pin the name on it. And it stuck through, uh, through DNA analysis. So one should get to know this mushroom. Uh, it comes in the summer and fall. Uh, and uh, see, it has a ring around it. It has a champagne color. Since you have these names, these mushrooms, you can go back and look at these slides later. And I would just recommend you go to Google the, the names and look at many different images of it. Be judicious there. Not all people who put a mushroom up, put a name on it, know what they're doing. But use, but use your, your common sense. You'll be able to figure out which of the sites are more, more valid and, and follow those through. So that's crenulata. Now there are some uh, mushrooms that have club-shaped bulbs that are not Amanita. This is Lepiota nosina or Leuco agaricus nosina or Leucocytes. Free white gills, a white spore print. And this mushroom, when you put, when you look at the spores, they're going to be dextrinoid. I think I have a picture of the dextrinoid oh, coming up. The dextrinoid, this dextrinoid, they'll be be red, reddish. Brown, brown spores, and they're going to have a pore in it. Amanita spores are not like this. So you know that that's not an amanita, although it looks like an amanita. Right? Uh, with this mushroom, those of you who've uh, been around for the poison, uh, uh, edible and poison mushrooms talk, this is an edible mushroom, yet I have known people have eaten this, and they've, uh, or they thought they were eating it, and they ate an amanita and ended up in the hospital near death. This is a very edible mushroom, very good. It's a, but it has a bulb at the bottom. This is a, a, the parasol mushroom, Lepiota procera or macro Lepiota procera. The, the names change. Here's a mushroom I should call to your attention. This is Volveria speciosa. This is a, like an Amanita. It has a bulb at the bottom. It has a uh, free gills, it's a gilled mushroom, but the spores are pink. So that puts it into, into the Pluteus family, not the Amanita family. And this is Volveriosa, Volveria speciosa. Now, I found this uh, June 16th, 2004. Walking along with a friend, we're going fishing, and it's in the middle of the path, and it just caught my attention. And I picked it, put it on the side of the, road, the path. We picked it up on the way out. And when I was able to identify it, I was able, pretty easy to identify it. This was only the second time in the history of collecting mushrooms in New York State that this mushroom had been documented in New York State. I think it's probably much more common, 
but people just, they might pick it, but they just don't take the effort to diagnose it properly, identify it properly, to dry it and send it off. So it's only the second one that's, that, that's ever been, been documented. So this is some of the work that you and I as, as citizen scientists can and should be doing all the time when we're out in the field. If you see something, say something. <laughs> is that what they say? If you see something, say something. If you see something interesting, it is, you know, why is it interesting? Follow that up. So some agarica species will have a bulb at the bottom. Uh, and now, uh, we'll look at another group of amanitas, the ones that have a, a radial margin uh, and a small ring zone. I know I'm rushing through this. I want to go through this with some dispatch, but not to be rambunctious, as my friends from, from uh, Ithaca warned me not to do. So I, I hope that I'm not getting too garbled in doing this. Uh, this small ring zone here uh, is, is characteristic of the Jamada group. And uh, uh, this crenulata shows up here again. That's a deadly one because it may have that that bulb may have a little frilly ring around the top of it. Pharaohs may do the same. Uh, so let's have a look at, at these and what they look like. So this is Jamata, and you see the gem kind of big big warts on the cap, which are gem-like. Uh, it uh, the vulva is on patches there. It's called Junquilla or Mappa or Russelloides, or people may have been using these names inappropriately, but though you'll find these. It, the mushroom is striate. And that means it's not going to have amyloid spores, uh, but that's that's what it looks like. This is a Jamada here, a little more yellow, but you see the, the wonderful, wonderfully defined warts on the top. And you see here, the club has a little ring zone around it. And that's the ring zone that, that would define Jamada. Here's Crenulata, and I used the same slide before. Uh, the, the natural variability, it might just be a plain bulb, or it might have a little fuzzy ring zone around it right there. And Lauren, I believe we're at the end of this group. Yes, okay, let me get you the next one going. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, what we have here is Frostina, uh, and it's, it has a single ring at the bottom, okay? So you find one of these mushrooms and not a ring zone, but just a single ring. And that is going to be, uh, well, it could be Amanita frostiana. Okay. So this is Farinosa, which has that uh, little ring at the bottom too. Uh, and again, a good, good, good group of Farinosa. You see the, the, the emarginate uh, structure here. And you see the, the powdery cap of that. This is Cinericonia, uh, and this this was collected by uh, Peter Katsaros and I, and was sent to, uh, I don't know, I've forgotten now, whether Santa Clark Rogerson at New York Botanical Garden, or whether he was consult, consulted, but uh, we collected that, and we, we brought went to a foray. It may have been the Rogerson foray we went to, and I suspect that was the case, given that, that name there, and it disappeared. So the verification on this is weak. Um, the Rogerson foray was over in Connecticut. So it's weak. We got good macroscopic uh, uh, look at this, but we the voucher is missing. So uh, we can't say for definite that this was collected here in New York State. And a bulb with a single collar here. Uh, um, this is the, the Pantherina group, uh, Amanita pantherina or the variations called Veletapes or Cothurnata or Multisquamosa, uh, also Albo Creata, Precox, and another called Species 23 here. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide there. That was my <laughs> Ithaca connection <laughs> contacted me to say, carry on. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing that. So this this is the the, the pantherine. It's found out west. I don't think it's ever been found uh, in New York State, but it could have been. You know, these things do move around. Uh, but um, if you find a brown pantherine with has that little bulb at the bottom, 
then then you might want to check the literature and make sure what, of what you got there. So this is one which is common, and uh, and Jenkins uh, says this is limited to the Northeast. It has this kind of uh, yellowish center on the top of it, but notice that ring. I mean, this collar is very distinctive. Nice little rim around the edge of it, just very distinctive. So you see that, uh, you know you've got a pantherina of one sort or another. This is uh, Malta squamosa. It is less pigmented in there. It's uh, more white, but, you, but the same thing. Look at that rim. It's just it just shouts at you. This is Corthionata. That's the name I learned it. I learned it. Corthionata is not used so much anymore. Malta squamosa, I believe, is. If you look at some of uh, um, Rod Tullis's website, you'll find my photographs of I don't know if this mushroom or not there as as illustration for that. Um, so, so we know for sure this mushroom is here in New York. And this is uh, 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 another Malta squamosa or Corthionata. You see that neat little rim around that. But look how close this mushroom looks to the next two. So this one is uh, Amanita praecox, which forms very early in the, in the year. Uh, in June, early June, you can find this mushroom out. And Albo creata, uh, the same thing. There's a difference here in, in how much the striation occurs. So again, when you find one of these, you know where to go. You know that this is one of the panthers. And you know, in this case, when they're small and they come out early, you go to look at Precox or Albo creata. You look at the details, you look at the spore, then you've got a microscope, you can check the spores or check the odor or check the taste or check some of the other descriptions that are given in the literature. And you come to a very good um, tentative ID. Here's one which uh, <laughs> is unidentified. It's still unidentified. Uh, I found this uh, in Phoenicia, the floodplain um, of the, uh, the Esophis. Uh, under oaks, again in June, in late June, but it was in June. And uh, it was so distinctive, and there were so many of them. There must have been 30 or 40 of them uh, scattered on, under oaks there. So I, I took photos of this and sent them off to to, um, to Rod, Rod Tullis, and he said, yeah, he doesn't know what it is, but he calls it Species 34 on his New Jersey and Pennsylvania checklist. So that's what I call it. When I went back and look at his checklist later, he has changed some of those designations. So I don't know what this would be called at the moment. But we know it's here. We just don't know the name of it. And here's Frostiana. Okay. The small, it looks like a small muscaria, but it's got this single ring around the bottom. Okay. It's striate, non amyloid. So let's look at the next group here, which you see the multiple rings around the bottom. And that's characteristic of the, the Mus Amanita muscaria group. It's a mushroom that has a bulb with uh, several rings around the top of it. And here we have lots and lots of names. Muscaria, Formosa, Album are three, three common ones that you see. But we'll look at a few other ones too. And you got a couple of southern species, Flave Volveta and Parasina. And then we'll look at Kokori as well. So again, a rather limited group of mushrooms by field identification. So I don't know who took this. This, this image shows up in my, in my storage of images. I don't know where it came from. I don't think it's my image, but I can't be sure about that. And I don't know where it came from. But this is a variety Formosa. Um, this is the common variety around here. In the deep south and out west and throughout Siberia, it's is red, scarlet red. Uh, this is the common fly agaric in, in, in those locations. Same uh, compounds apparently here. So this is call, called formosa, which I think means pleasing. And uh, around uh, the turn of the century here, we started calling this gasawia because we realized that, that the the, the Gasawi I name was, was offered in 1913, so it goes back to use a previous name, but it's different from the, the ones that were in Europe, which is which was defined in Europe. Uh, Rod Tallis calls this Ameri, Ameri, America Musicaria. Um, so 
there are lots and there are lots of names. So this is the common mushroom you, you see around here. It's for sure around here. Can you see the rings at the bottom, multiple rings here? There's the annulus just breaking loose from the gills there, the warts on the cap. Uh, if you're looking from the top, you might think a gemata and a muscaria are the same. They're somewhat similar, but they would have a different kind of ring structure at the bottom. And if you were very careful, you would see a different kind of structure of the warts. And you can, by look at the warts microscopically, you'll see that they are they're, they have a different structure to them. Um, there is a white uh, Amanita muscaria. That's variety alba. In this case, it's a variety. So um, tells us that there are two things that are going on, not only the color, but there's something else which is different from the other um, Amanita muscaria. So this is across uh, the northern states. I find it more on the top of uh, Slide Mountain, for example, in the Catskills than I do in the valleys. Now, at one time, I thought this might have been a variety Persicina, uh, this sort of melon yellow color, uh, which you see more here than here, and vulva more as a powder, and it's got rings at the base. Also, it's mycorrhiza with two and three needle pines, which we see here, two and three needle pines. So uh, I thought that might have been that, but uh, this this is a weak verification uh, only by macroscopic features, so I, I don't have a voucher on that, so I can't be sure for, for certain. Here's one which uh, which is definitely moving north. Uh, this is uh, Amanita cocori, has these white recurved rings going down and also has a double-edged annulus. Um, so this is eradicating bulb. Uh, it's in section Lepidella. Uh, this, I, I think the New, I found this in 1984 and I believe it to be a New York record at that time. No one else had, hadn't been collected in New York until that time or hadn't been vouchered by that time. But collecting it and vouchering it became a record. And then a year later, I found it in Massachusetts. And then a few years later, Alan Bissett found it in Massachusetts as well. This, this mushroom is now common in the Northeast and it's moving north at a, at a very rapid clip. So these Lepidellas often are, are confined to the, the Gulf states, or, well, or the, their Gulf state mushroom, or the Atlantic coastal plain, but they are moving up and they're in the mountains around here as well. Um, don't need to point out to you that the temperature around here is warming. We have, uh, well, <laughs> just, let, just let me leave it at that. Temperature's warming. Move on to the large bulb. Uh, large bulb here can be either cleft or feel like a marshmallow. And there are two groups here. The ones that have a cleft bulb are in the Amanita brunescence group. We'll look at those. And the ones that have a marshmallow group are in the Amanita citrina group. And we'll have a look at those. So here is uh, one with a cleft bulb. See at the bottom has a little, the bulb has a little split in it. And when you dig up some of these bulbs right at the beginning, you can see this here. This is brown, brunescence browning. And you can see it has this cleft bulb. So that's very clear what we're dealing with here. Uh, the bulb in this is buried under the ground, so we don't get to see it. It's probably cleft on the other side of this. It doesn't have to be on both sides. But this is a very common mushrooms in the, in the Northeast. Okay, One of the most commonly collected ones in the Northeast. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell if it's brown or if it's uh, red, brunescence or brunescence. But uh, you can do that by looking at the, at the chemical analysis, I'll tell you. But also, if you look at the cleft bulb, this one here, is having a cleft bulb is going to be brunescence. We well, see here two 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 forms. Uh, there's the uh, variety brunescence, which is brown, the cleft here, and variety pallida, which is white, left here. The variety pallida is sometimes called estivalis, which means summer summer mushroom. So we'll have another look at this. Here's a. Uh, Here's Pallida, Krieger's name, Estevalis, the singer's name. It's often misidentified as Amanita bisporigia or Amanita verosa. Uh, you see this split at the bottom here. This one is not, I wouldn't necessarily say it's not poisonous. You can get sick by it, but you won't, it's not as poisonous as 
as uh, Bisporigera, which is the, one of the destroying angels, absolutely deadly. So here again, here's Bisporigera, a saccate bulb. We haven't looked at those yet. And here, Estevalus with a cleft bulb. And I'll look at the bulb detail. Occasionally, you'll find Amanita sprita, which has a cleft bulb at the bottom. Okay. You see here the striations here. Spores are going to be non-amyloid. You see the ring around the stem here. <clears throat> Here's a mushroom right between the, the Brunescence group and the Citrana group, just by the bulb shape. This is a marshmallow kind of bulb. So it's, it's not cleft. Usually it can be. That's why I put it here. But uh, this is Amanita abrupta. And it has what's called a subradicating bulb. We'll see it again in another grouping. <coughs> this is Amanita citrina, variety citrina. It's yellowish and has a potato odor and a typically large bulb. Somewhat saccate, but it's been more, more like a marshmallow, more wrapped around that. And this is in section Phalloidiae, uh, which is contains the poison, the poison mushrooms, uh, the deadly poison ones. So uh, Tallis now calls this Amara citrina, but that's, and we'll see that there's several other citrinas as well. But this citrina tends to have pinkish warts, doesn't always have a spotted neft, neft on it. But it, uh, uh, salamander, but it has these pinkish kind of warts. So here's uh, Amanita gemata and Citrina. You might, from the top, think they were the same mushroom because the cap looks somewhat similar. But there's, uh, this has a neat ring zone, this has a marshmallow bulb. So you want to dig the mush, Amanita, always dig them up, see what the bulb is like to tell who, who they are. And these bulb characteristics are much more enduring than the characteristics of the cap. Sun can bleach them out, rain can bleach them out. Um, um, but the, this, the, the, the bulb type is, is much more indicative. Again, here is Bisporigera, the old Verosa Bisporigera and Citrina. Uh, you see the difference here in the sac structure. It takes, it take a, it takes a while to get to see some of these different, some of them are intergrade. And actually this is an intergrading thing right here. This for all intents and purposes is a citrina, but the bulb type is much more like a, a, a in this case it's much more like a phalloides. And several collections uh, I got of this mushroom uh, in 2012, they were all collected under Norway spruce. Uh, and this, the Norway spruce were brought over uh, in 1930s from Norway by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And those, when you brought those trees over, they brought Amanita phylloides over with them. So I go there to places like that to look for Amanita phylloides, which around here is a very rare mushroom. Um, it would be fruiting right now. Right now it would be fruiting. And if I were going to look for it now, I would go up to the the spruce that were transplanted in the 1930s up around uh, um, the Appalachian Trail on the eastern part of Dutchess County. It goes through the town of, um, is that town over there? Name escapes me now. <laughs> but uh, those spruce plantations are, uh, is where you find this. So I found this in, in one down, found this down in, uh, in Westchester County place where I collected phylloides in the past. So I sent that to Rod, and he said there are at least three things that are going around which are call, currently go, going to the name Amanita citrina. So these names change all the time. The mushrooms stay the same, but do we call this citrina or do we give it a different name? That usually now depends on DNA work. There is a variety of citrina called Lavendula, it has a lavender kind of colorations to it. And uh, this is a southern mushroom. And uh, the first voucher that I know of that was uh, found in New York was one that I collected 
in uh, 1989. And it's a robust documentation. I have a voucher sent. And so now it's not at all uncommon in the Northeast. It's pretty common. You find it around here and there. Here's another, here's a very rare thing here. This is a poroid amanita. Rather than gills, it has pores. This is amanita citrina with pores. And I suspect that's a disease. Uh, in every, every other aspect, this, when you look at the spores under magnification, the odor of it, the stature of it, everything else looks like amanita citrina, but it has pores. So um, it just, just goes to show you. I don't know what it goes to show you, but it goes to show you the world's full of surprises. This is a pretty rare mushroom, uh, rarely reported, uh, Amnita solaniolens, uh, and it was only described in 74. It has olive tones and a potato odor. Uh, and again, you find that kind of, it's a marshmallow bulb, but it's much smaller. It's uncommon, it's more common to the north, uh, so it's, you're more likely to find that up in the Adirondacks than around here. Um, but that's, uh, this one I believe is now vouchered in the, the uh, up in Albany. This is Amanita porphyria. And there are two forms of this, is the brown form and a purple form. And they have that marshmallow kind of base to the bottom of them. And you see here a really clear brown coloration. And they often have what's called a chevron pattern, particularly below the, the, uh, the ring. Chevron is a kind of rattlesnake, snakeskin kind of pattern. And here's the purple form. Okay. And so both of those you can think of as purple forms of uh, Amanita citrina. I suspect that when they get around to looking at the DNA in these, if they find there are differences in the DNA, then they won't call this a brown form. They'll give it one name and they'll give the, the purple one a different name. And uh, Lauren, we need your help. We are at the end of this batch of slides. Uh, okay. Now we move on to the base with an adhering cup. Uh, this is the Amanita Cecilia group. It goes by the name of Cecilia Inerata Strangulata. And recently, Yves Amaro from uh, Canada, French Canada, has given it the name Racopus on the end. So because Cecilia is a European form, these names are all changing. Uh, Rod calls one of them uh, white Cecilia, he called it W2. Um, an olive Cecilia, he called New Jersey uh, 42. An orange Cecilia, he called uh, N12. Uh, N29 was Ario, Ario, Ario Solia. Solia. Uh, chestnut cap, a yellow cup, very rare. I think I have a photo of that one. Spreda sometimes uh, uh, has this adhering cup at the bottom. And submaculata has, a, has not only that adhering cup, but a really different annular structure. And that's what gives that away. So let's look at this group. So here's Amanita porphyria and Cecilia. And this is in the last group we looked at. They look pretty much the same from the top, except one's non-strite and one's striate. If you pick that up, you can separate them. But they have a chevron pattern here. This one has a marshmallow bulb, and Cecilia has an adhering cup. Okay. So we'll see what that, that adhering cup looks like here. This is uh, Amanita Cecilia, uh, or Strangulata, uh, or Racopus, uh, or Inerata. Uh, it has a striate margin. We'll look at that up close in a minute. But it has this, this, this skirt at the bottom where the, 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 the bulb, as, it ex, as the mushroom expands, the bulb collapses around the stem and makes this adherence to it down here. Well, I would look at that here. And you see how, it, how the, it just tightly wraps around it. You can also see a bit of the, the striations and the chevron pattern. There's a real care. I mean, that is Amanita Cecilia, Amanita Inerata, uh, Racopus. That's, that's what you got then. The white form here is uh, Borealis sorora. It used to be species V2, and now it's called Racopus. But again, you see that tightly adhering thing here, and it's white. Okay. Uh, the next one we're going to look at here is the orange one. You can clearly see it's orange. Yeah. 
So to be, describe a mushroom, uh, Rod would have to look at that, make various collections of it, make sure what he's looking at here is not environmental, but it's really truly with that mushroom. Then he would describe it in impeccable detail and uh, and search the literature. If no one else has described that mushroom, he then could give it a new name, a, a name, and uh, and publish the name. This is an unnamed, undescribed uh, black Cecilia. And here's Spreda. And if you look at the bottom, you see where the cup can adhere to the bottom. So I've used the same photo on this a few times just to show you how how confusing some of these can be. But if you if you take care, you can you can you can make a good distinction. Here you see how it's adhering. This is submaculata. It has this adhering cup at the bottom, okay, this deep pressed cup, often with a rim like that. It has two very distinctive things. Uh, it has this ball gown annulus. The way the, the, the ring separates from the gills, it sort of hangs in the middle there and hangs loose like, a, like a, a dancer's gown, a woman dancer's ball gown. And that's pretty consistent. That is, that is, occasionally I find one where that's wa washed off or wiped off, but, but that's very consistent. Uh, this, I found this in, 19, in 2011 in Millbrook here, and uh, perhaps only the second New York collection of that. And here is uh, the eye spot, submaculata, the eye spot here. And this one was collected in Rockland, Maine, and that's, uh, that was in 1911. That was the northernmost collection of that mushroom. So again, we see this mushroom moving north. When you look at a stout sack-like vulva, there we're getting into the deadly mushrooms. This, these are the, the destroying angel group here. Uh, we're going to look at Verosa and Bisperiger and Verna. All of those mushrooms, which, are, which were valid names at one point, are now superseded by Amanita bisperigera. Uh, that, and then there's probably another 10 or 15 species which have minor variations. So we're looking here at the, the, the destroying angel, the Bisperigera group. Also, phylloides is in this group, and that's a transplant from Europe, and we'll have a look at that one too. There are some edible, so these are all deadly mushrooms, and then we have some edible ones, hemibafa or caesarea or caesarea, uh, umbanata, uh, uh, and that, that, those, those would be edible. And then some very small ones here, we'll have a look at those too. So this is the, the destroying angel, uh, uh, a cubic centimeter of this mushroom that's about the size of your little fingernail is a lethal dose. The poison cannot be cooked out of it. It takes about a week to kill you, and it does it by taking care of your red blood cells and your kidneys and your liver, and the poisons recirculate and shuts down your, your nervous system. So it's a very common mushroom. Look at this big sack at the bottom. Big sack, just a white mushroom has ring around it, white gills, big sack at the bottom. That's a dead giveaway. So here's a variation in bulbs, the one I just showed you. Here's one similar to it and a few others. If you remember that citrina right, we looked at not long ago, had a bulb structure very similar to this. Um, it used to be thought that if you put uh, KOH, uh, on the cap and it turned yellow, they could wait as ways to separate these out. But we now think that they're all, um, all will show that, that staining reaction. It used to be thought that the shaggy stem was going to be verosa, but we know that that's not true either. According to Rod Tullis, uh, verosa is a European sp uh, species. Uh, it does not appear in North America unless it's been brought over. Uh, has been um, misidentified. He thinks that what happened was that a white phylloides came over, and that was uh, was 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 then killed people, poison, and we we thought that that was the verosa. Uh, but his analysis and, and and his field analysis, microscopic analysis, and then the DNA all shows that these are all bisporigera. So there are now about ten to twenty different segregate species. Uh, and, and once all that's sorted out, they'll be named. But what they have in common 
uh, are these the sac at the bottom, this white uh, this ring around the stem, these white free gills uh, that's emanated by Sporigera. I put the deer skull there. It didn't work there. You see the bulb at the bottom there. Uh, this it, it, at one point it was thought that, and this, this is true, that that when you look at the basidia, the normal four spore basidia of the uh, this, the of the Amanita um, verosa, uh, which we now call Vicepirigera. In the spring of the year, they have two spores. In the fall of the year, they have four spores. And particularly where in the, where in the gills you look at it, you look at it right in the middle of the gills or the edge of the gills, you find Basidia there with different numbers of spores. Uh, I, that that has been thrown into some uh, uh, speculation now. And now the, the current consensus is that all of them will have four spores, even the ones called Bisporigera. So this is Citrina, and this is Verosa Bisporigera. You see that, that bigger bulb here. It's a little firmer. This is a, a spongy shape there. This one, uh, Citrina, will have a potato-like odor. Verosa will have a sickeningly sweet uh, uh, odor, or sometimes it smells like chlorine, but it's usually a sickeningly sweet odor. Here's Amanita phylloides. It's called the death cap. In this mushroom, the vulva breaks open the leaf, big patches on the top of the cap. Uh, this was taken with a with film camera, didn't capture the brassy tones as well as the next slides I think I've got here. Next slides here taken with a digital camera, more of the, the brassy tones there. So under Norway spruce, almost always from civilian conservation core plantations. Uh, October and November, it's a very late fruiting mushroom. Uh, and this is a deadly poison. This is Amanita caesarea or caesarea, uh, uh, sometimes called hemibafa if it's over in Japan. Umbanada is a name given for uh, for a, a, one of the varieties in the Northeast. Jacksonii is sometimes called American Caesar's mushroom. And it's this beautiful mushroom with a white vulva and a red the rest of the mushroom is red, uh, sort of yellow, orange gills and annulus and stem. A beautiful mushroom. Uh, I mean, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Amnita caesarea. It's one of the characteristics that the stem is hollow. Okay. So I've never eaten that mushroom. I don't know if I could bring myself to do it. But uh, it is sometimes uh, locally rather common. I mean, I found this... Uh, in the northern uh, Catskills and the southern Adirondacks, northern Catskills, just maybe not a, not quite a peck basket full, but it, but certainly a small that creole could be full of those, and they are apparently very tasty. I just never eaten it. So this is an orange one. Uh, tell us, call that number sixteen. It's an orange-brown Caesarea. Uh, it's also called Umbanada by Reno um, Pomerlo or Jacksonia by Pomerlo. Uh, it's now been given a name to Tolosi to by Guzman in Rimes Gunan. So named after Rod Tolis. This is Amanita Beningiana. Uh, it look it's like a yellow hemibafa. It's very rare. I've never collected that. This is from a from a foray we were on. This was up in uh, New London, Connecticut. And that was fun. This is a very small uh, Amanita. Uh, it's Amanita virginiana. It's very small, tends to grow in grass, and it's rarely reported. I found this mushroom in 1990, and at that point, it was the only recorded uh, occurrence of that mushroom in New York State. Uh, since that, it's, it's shown up in Connecticut, and Diana Stat, uh, Smith has a photograph that on her website. Uh, when we were on a, I was on a foray with uh, with Roger Phillips, so it was my traveling companion then. Uh, he, he and I were, were friends, so 
we were out traveling together and a woman on the bus we were on uh, did not want to approach him. Uh, so she approached me and said, well, what do you think this mushroom is? And I said, I think I know what it is. You bring it and show it to Rod. And that is that was found in 2007 in Colchester, Connecticut, and that's Amanita virginiana. So 1990, it was in Pauling, New York, 2007 in Colchester, Connecticut, and 2010, it, we found it in Camden, Maine. So that's the one in Camden, Maine there. So again, another uh, mushroom moving north. This is one quite similar. It's, it's, it's similar in size and stature. It's also moving north, but it has a different kind of vulva. Um, Tullus calls, says in this one, the bulb resembles popcorn. And again, it's rarely reported because only an inch or two. Uh, you see, it's clearly uh, striated margin, got a ring around it. So uh, that one would be the, the northern, I think that's the, the northernmost reporting of that mushroom as of now. Now, uh, with and without an annulus, deep vulva with and without an annulus, we looked at this group here. It's a rather large group. It's the Virginiana group. I'm sorry, the Vaginata group. Vaginata, fulva, Seneca flava, vulveda, pecchiana. And then with an annulus, we've got Verosa uh, and Spreda, Beningiana, and Whetstonia. So let's look at some of those. So this is the common grisette, the steel gray uh, uh, Amanita, or Amanitopsis, it was called at one time, Vaginata. And there's the invaginate uh, vulva there, clearly striate. Comparing Cecilia with Vaginata, you see here the, the, uh, the, the, the cup is very similar. It's, it's adhering here, and here there's actually a space between the cup and the stem. Uh, you can see, it's, otherwise, they're, they're quite similar in appearance. Um, this is taken with an earlier camera, obviously. This is variety Alba. This is a variety Livida. It's brown. A 44 is a deep brown vaginata. This one is uh, Amanita fulva. It has that kind of foxy color, uh, tawny, foxy, red-brown, uh, with a white, white cup on the bottom. This is a new one. This is a uh, Rod uh, Tullus named this Sinico Flava, uh, Chinese yellow cap, and a gray vulva. The vulva turns gray, and so this one is now, after he's published this name, now not it shows up here and there. So you see the vulva is graying uh, in that Chinese yellow cap. Uh, here we're going to find uh, ones which look a lot like uh, Bisporigera. But this is Volveda. It's a non straight margin. Uh, it usually does not have a ring around it. Here's Volveda, you see the vulva, the cup at the bottom, like Volveda, and here's the Verosa, the same kind of cup. So they're quite similar, and often I can, can misidentify them. Oh, oh. hey, uh, we are, Lauren, we're at the end of that group for two. Last group of mushrooms. Uh, this is Amanita pecchiana. It's like that Volveda, but it has pink uh, on the inside of the cap. Uh, so, you know, sometimes there is a little different species, I guess. Sometimes, uh, usually it's typical with an annulus. Sometimes it doesn't have an annulus around it, uh, but that would be Amanita Volveda. And a very small one, much smaller, and there's some differences in the, I think it's in the clamp connections of the cells that lead up to the gills. They're different in that, and Tullus called that pseudovolveda. He's called it A number 41, but after he worked it up, it's called pseudovolveda. And actually, this one now is probably more common than this. Uh, I just 
I find many, many of these, many more uh, uh, suited Volveda than I do Volveda. Here's one I grew from an egg. Took the bulb, grew it in a jar, a humid environment with, with towels under it that are wet, and it just expands and makes this little thing there. And here's another thing of pseudo Volveda. Here's an interesting thing because the Volveda Pechiana complex, again, it has a poured uh, hymenium. And there again, it's not quite as poured as the others, but you can see the difference in gills and pores. This is Volveda variety elongata peas, a peck uh, description from a hundred and so years ago, uh, also called elongata spora, and Rod Tullis now calls it Amnita dolichopus. Field determination of Amnita section and Medella are notoriously prone to error. Check of spore size and shape and examination of the lamella trauma. That's the gill trauma, the, the section from which the, the gills and, and basidia emerge. It's recommended for achieving an accurate determination. You and I probably won't, well, you certainly can't do it without a microscope, but were we in a workshop, we could, we could do those things. This is wet stonii, and uh, it is a remarkable mushroom. You see how tall it is is very tall and this is the soil line here so look how deep and, and long that tubular vulva is it's i mean the only one like that you're likely to see and you can identify that by field characteristics alone uh, that mushroom was found uh, up in pine plains new york um, the base of uh well what's that mountain up there Name escapes me at the moment, but it's up in Pine Plains. Uh, deep vulva with an annulus, that could be vulveda. Occasionally it has that, so you find a deep vulva with an annulus, it might be that. If it's vulveda, if it has a ring, the ring is midway up the stem, and bisporidia is quite different. Bisporidia is all the way at the top of the stem. So if it's down here, it's, you're probably dealing with that vulveda. And then it's sprayed out with a ring around the stem and a deep, deep vulva. Now, not all uh, mushrooms that spring from an egg uh, and have a, a, a vulva or amanita. This is a vulvariella bombacina emerges from a vulva. And here is what looks like an evaginated rushula, and probably that's an environmental condition. Rushlas, I mean, don't come from a bulb, but somehow this looks like it did. Turn shape of rooting bulbs. We have a lot of them here. This is going to be the Lepidella section. I want to get through these quickly. Let's just look at some of these. That's Amanita dosipes. It's in state record as of 1986. First one collected. This is in 2009 over uh, in next to the sofas again. Uh, this is Kokori. Uh, found 84 in Millbrook, New York. Uh, now found throughout the Northeast, I think. Uh, this is a, 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 another look at Kokori with log scales and double-edged annulus. We looked at that before as well. And a group, and one called sub which is smaller. This was found in 2008. This is a very rare mushroom. This is a Squamanita ombonata. It's not an amanita. It has attached gills. It used to be called amanita, but now we know that it we think it grows from, it's parasitic on species of amanita. So it's a very rare, striking mushroom. It's the only collection I have. It may be found once a season throughout the, the world, which is a very, very rare, rare mushroom. I found that one over in um, nearby Connecticut. And we looked at uh, Abrupta with a moderately subradicating bulb. We've looked at that already. At Consonina pelioma and canescens are the next group here. We've, we've seen abrupta. This is at Consoniana, which I, I find very commonly in the Northeast now. It often comes up early in the spring. Subradicating because the bulb doesn't go very deep, but it's below the surface, goes below the surface. 
Now, this one is one of the most interesting mushrooms of, of all, I think, is Amanita pelioma. Uh, and I found that uh, in 1988 in uh, Black Rock Forest. I mean, it's a very robust specimen because we have the photographs, we have the voucher, and it is so distinctive. It has cafe au lait gills, okay? And it has this, uh, the gills of this are not white, they're cafe au lait. And the bulb stains blue-green. I don't know of any other Amanita that does that. Uh, the last time I checked two or three years ago, this was still the only collection made north of Virginia. Now, how it got in Black Rock Forest, which is over near West Point, I don't know. But it showed up there, and it was clear. It was, wasn't the only one. There was a there was another one beside it. So it was clear that this this was there, and uh, we've got a voucher on it. Uh, but it now maybe it's still over there. The last time I went to look. The area where I collected this was overgrown with um, that prickly shrub uh, that infects wheat, wheat rust. You'll know what it is. Barberry. And I couldn't get in to, to dig, look for this mushroom anymore. This is another mushroom which is moving north. This is Amanita canescens. Um, and you can look at the the, the, the description of this at, at your leisure. I want to point out how, how it's moving north. This one here, uh, in 2008, I, was, I found this in Pine Plains, New York. Okay, and that was the northernmost record. Here in the year before, in 2007, Rod found it over in uh, Connecticut. It was brought in Connecticut. See how it Looks like someone Patterson brought it in. I don't know who it was, but it, it has this golden threads on the stipe. Uh, here's another collection of this I found, and this was in Phoenicia, New York in 2011. So that was a good year for it. As Rod says it occurs in both the deciduous and mixed woods, usually with oak, um, extending at least to from Connecticut to Alabama. But we know it's in New York as well. This is uh, probably a, an environmental oddity of rooting flavorubescence. Here's a rooting bulb, a Rupalopus. It goes very deep. This was taken with an old film camera that didn't have a very good lens on it. Uh, found that in Millbrook. Uh, One, uh, these these root very deeply. One un, unnamed species roots so deeply that it's never been completely collected. And it's called a magna radex, magna, magna, magna radex. Uh, long, a longer piece. Uh, this, uh, again, a New York record in 1889, 1989. The reason why there's so many New York records at that point is because Jenkins had published a monograph just a year before, year or two before. And so having that monograph, I was able to now identify these mushrooms, which were out there, which were out, were out there before, I'm sure, but we didn't know what they were. Here's another state record the same year, and this would be Anusta. So these are, these are around now that we have a way of identifying, we can document them. And again, this one here we've seen before, it doesn't have a, we don't have a voucher on that, so it's a weak record. And I've never collected this mushroom, Chlorinusma. There are some non-Amanita mushrooms that root, and the Calibia, so the rooting Calibia, this used to be called Zerula rubobrunescens. Zerula furfuracea is another one. Let's see what are some other names of this. Uh, Calibia Zerula usmanciella maga Calibia. So there's a lot of different names of, uh, which are applied to that mushroom. Okay, just to wrap this up too, uh, when you go out to collect mushrooms, uh, the field work here really involves collecting and documenting the mushroom. You'll recognize this maybe from a previous slide. So you first we do a tentative ID with field guides or maybe with this tool that we now have at our hands. And then we go to monographs and monographs are technical descriptions of mushrooms, usually of one genus. Okay. Um, I, online, I would go first to Mushroom Expert, 
and then then to Rod's Rod's uh, studies of eminent TCA. Uh, the names are going to be different because they're just they, they change the names change so quickly. Uh, when Roy Holling uh, retired from his office as the head of mycology at the New York Botanical Garden, he said he no longer could keep up with even the genus names of the Bodleys, and that was his specialty. They, it changed that much. So once you make a once you make an identification, you're going to do a workup in the home lab, or had we had a workshop, we would make it. We would be doing documentation there with microscopic work and chemicals. And we'll make descriptions. And we'll look at microscopic details. We'll do descriptions of them. We'll make we'll make entries. We'll dry the mushroom and then send it off to uh, to as a voucher, so that now science would know where that mushroom is, and they could document things like warming or extirpation where mushrooms no longer exist. And all of this is made possible now. I think we can do very good work just with a pencil, just with a pencil and notes on a on a deck of cards like this, I think you and I can make very good uh, tentative IDs. They'll have to be verified and ultimately by DNA work, but you and I won't do that and you and I don't care and no one carries that equipment out into the field. So you have to make field IDs to bring the mushroom home to do it. So, and that's the end. And I think now we can, <laughs> I don't know how many questions we have. It looks like there's a red dot up there and uh, we can see what kinds of questions we have and take it from there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bill, for uh, such a great presentation. Um, we just have uh, just a few little things there. If anyone um, does have questions now that Bill is all done, something you just thought of, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, right now, there's a couple of comments from Joe there. He says, you're doing great. You're not at all rambunctious. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. And uh, and another, he said, a big takeaway for me, all the ones I thought were obviously Amanita muscaria probably worked. So. Yes, right. That's that right. The mistake. We all make that mistake. We, we all <laughs> make that mistake. When I first started to collect for the New York Botanical Garden, I have so many of them <laughs> called muscaria. And it's embarrassing. It is so embarrassing. <laughs> but, uh, but you should know that even the experts make those mistakes. If you go to a foray, where there are a dozen experts or two dozen experts or maybe 30 experts and 300 uh, volunteers, citizen scientists going out and collecting. We bring the mushrooms back, they get identified, they get put out on tables. And invariably, someone of noted authority will put his, 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 his signature on an identification on a table and someone else of equal noted authority will come along and scratch it out and put another name on it. Invariably, you see that. It's just, it's one of those incredible things. They, Mr. Jeff, get very rambunctious about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I know. I've seen it. There's so many times that, that I have heard what you just said is that uh, even the experts make mistakes um, on identifying them because there's, there's so uh, many different characteristics to look at. And sometimes the mushrooms are so incredibly similar that, uh, that you do yeah. second guess yourself. And That's you're, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah that happens. Um, yeah, mostly we just have, you know, thanking you for your um, presentation, though I enjoy um, Libby Rose's comment. Cecilia, you're breaking my heart. You're, my heart. Your cup has adhered to your base. <laughs> what was the part of it? The second part? Cecilia, you're breaking uh, my Cecilia, heart. you're breaking my heart. Your cup has adhered to your base. So. <laughs> Like we'll song. go on there. We'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, this this really was a very informative um in six and, eight time. That's gotta be in six eight time, I think. <laughs> yeah, it does. I know I wasn't doing it in the right time there for the <laughs> for the song. <laughs> I got that part wrong. But uh but yeah, this was a very full and informative um presentation on Amanita. Um it's uh, quite a huge Quite a huge genus, and there's a lot going on in there, um, and they're fascinating mushrooms. So, so uh, thank you for your time tonight. You bet. I'm glad we were able to do this, uh, and uh, hopefully, well, well, I think hopefully two things. I hope for, I hope that Mohonk will set aside a place where where the public can uh, can go and collect a small section of, of that for environment, environmental studies. And I hope that finally we'll be able to get uh, that workshop uh, 
situation going out in uh, at the Smiley Center too. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. That's something that you and I um, can touch base on um, in a little bit. So we'll, uh, when hopefully something soon will be coming up in 2024 Good. for uh, workshops and things. That oh, would be great. great. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. 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 Well, well I, I think that everyone is just saying thank you for your time and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this has been recorded. So, um, so you might be watching this after the fact, but, um, there's plenty of other recordings that Bill has done over the past few years in our archive. And you can certainly check that out. I will send links to everyone, um, for those. And just in case you're wondering where to find those. So it's oh, on our you. Mohawk Preserve webpage under, um, virtual recordings. Um, and you'll see our archives. There's quite a robust um, uh, uh, mushroom category since Bill's done so many of these over the past couple of years. So there's lots more to learn about. Okay, well, that's very nice. Uh, and thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Bill. We'll be in touch. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Okay, adios.